It's my privilege this morning to bring a message uh, from the scriptures, and I'm really grateful to Hermie for reading the passage for this morning. I've called this talk New Resources, Standing Firm in the Lord, a discipleship class. I wonder if you've ever done a correspondence course. I remember when I first became a Christian, I really wanted to grow in my newfound faith. I loved Jesus, but I wanted to grow. I remember that I'd given Jesus everything and I was learning to be a worshiper, not just on a Sunday, but every day. I was learning to pray every day and I would meet with other uh, Christians just to read the Bible and to pray together. And within months of my coming to faith in Jesus, I was being invited to speak at little tiny chapels around the area where I lived and I had the joy of seeing people come to faith in Jesus. But I didn't know very much about the Bible. I hadn't studied it and um, I wasn't very disciplined. It's one of my faults. So I decided to enroll in a correspondence course. These were the days before I had a computer or anything like that. And I enrolled with a London university to do an A-level in New Testament studies. And it forced me in a way to read my Bible every day. And I would be sent through the post, studies to do, things to learn, and essays to write. And I think it really helped my discipleship to put those disciplines in place. And I like to see Paul's letter to the Philippians in a similar way, that it's a discipleship class by correspondence. Paul has written to the believers in Philippi to instruct them and to give them teaching about how to live as believers in Jesus. And as Paul nears the end of this letter, he takes up this exhortation, this charge, stand firm in the Lord. And in the midst of life with all its joys and sorrows, in the midst of life as believers in Philippi facing opposition, Paul encourages them to stand firm in the Lord. But how? How are they to do that? He writes in verse 1 of chapter 4, stand firm in the Lord in this way. And then from verse 4 to 9, he outlines some of the ways they can do that. Having dealt with some necessary admonitions, Paul picks up on this theme of joy once again. Standing firm in the Lord will be about our ongoing relationship with Jesus. And in these verses, Paul gives us some invaluable tips in this discipleship lesson. I've picked out five. The first tip, enjoy the Lord. The Christian life is a joyful life. We've called this series Joyful Living. But some of us, as we go on in our faith, can lose that joy in Jesus. Maybe it's the circumstances of our lives. Maybe it's other things that have surrounded us. And if that is true, we need to rediscover that joy. If being a Christian has become hard work or a chore, we need to rediscover the main thing, that we are loved by God. The enemy's aim would be for us to doubt God's love, his goodness, his kindness. He's used that tactic from the very beginning. But 16 times in this short letter, Paul uses the word joy or rejoice. And here in verse 4, he repeats it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again. Rejoice. See, Paul had never got over the wonder of it all, the wonder of his salvation, the gospel, the fact that Jesus had loved him, died for him forgiven him, saved him, and given him eternal life as a gift, that Jesus had chosen him, even though he'd been an enemy of the church. As Jesus has chosen each one of us, as it says in John 15. Paul never lost his joy in the Lord. 
So much so that even in the midst of difficulties, Paul could rejoice in the Lord. Remember how he went to Philippi, was arrested and put in prison. He and Silas sang their songs of worship and prayed, even as they were in prison. Remember one of the first converts in Philippi was the actual jailer. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a big football tournament going on at the moment. The European Championships and England have got through to the final. This week, I heard one of the football pundits say this, and it caught my attention because of the passage that I was studying for this week. He said, we can rejoice in our team tonight. Rejoicing means to delight in, to enjoy, to celebrate. And Paul is writing here to the Philippians something so much bigger and more special than a football match. We can rejoice in the Lord, delight in, enjoy, celebrate the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. As believers in Jesus, we should be the most joyful people on earth. Think of the celebrations that the football team winning has caused. How much more have we got to celebrate? How much more have we got to delight in? How much more can we enjoy God's love for us. We worship Jesus, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. Now we may in our lives have much that we want to rejoice about, or we may feel, especially in this past year and up to 18 months, there's been not much to rejoice about, it's been hard. But one thing always remains, and Paul reminds us again, rejoice in the Lord, his love never fails. He has never failed us, and he's not going to start now. So that's the first thing. Rediscover our joy in the Lord. Enjoy your relationship with God. Second tip, let your gentleness be evident to all, says Paul, because the Lord is near. Paul says something of the outworking of our joy will be visible to others who see us. We are to live out our hope live out our assurance in gentleness and graciousness and forbearance. This will become a demonstration of the gospel in our lives as we seek, as Paul has called us to, to have that attitude, the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who was not self-seeking, who looked to the interests of others. We as a people of God are not called to be those who just look to our own interests, but to others. To not be abrasive or judgmental, but kind. Paul says that we can live like this because the Lord is near. This expression, the Lord is near, has a double meaning for us. The Lord is near means he's coming soon. Paul had that expectation. And we should be living expectantly as Paul did. The most glorious day is about to dawn when Jesus comes again and we shall see him and we will be like him. We live in that expectation. We can be gracious. We can afford to see a longer perspective. So we can lay down things like aggravation or unforgiveness because we can leave it with the Lord. I was struck so much, if you've seen the testimony this week of Mina Smallman, a woman who lost her two daughters, they were killed by a very evil man. Yet she spoke of forgiveness, she spoke of the Lord's being near to her. She wouldn't let that evil have a victory over her. And maybe for us, we're unable to let things go because the Lord is near. The other meaning of the Lord is near is that he is with us. He is present with us. We can walk with him, talk with him. We can give to him all our cares and concerns. We can listen to him. We can abide in him. And we love to please him and we hate to let him down. And we want to love him more. And that will be reflected in the way that we live. The third point is this. Paul says, don't worry, don't be anxious about anything. Now, this isn't talking about clinical anxiety or depression. 
If we've not experienced these things ourselves, we all know the pain and the suffering of those we love who have experienced mental turmoil with depression or anxiety. Now, I believe Paul is talking about those everyday worries, those everyday doubts, and says, do not worry. Jesus said it first from Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. Do not worry, said Jesus. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Jesus encouraged us to seek his kingdom first. But everyday worry and anxiety can blight our lives. Winston Churchill said this, When I look back on all my worries, I remember the old man who said on his deathbed that he had had a lot of trouble in his life, most of which had never happened. I remember watching a film called The Bridge of Spies, a character played by the actor Mark Rylance. He was a captured spy. When asked again and again if he was worried, he would say this, would it help? Worry doesn't lift a finger to help us in any situation. Worry is a thief. It robs us of our joy. So what does Paul encourage us to do with our worries and concerns and our anxiety? He says, do not be anxious about everything, anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Turn worry into prayer. Now, worry would have been a way of life for the Philippians, the pagan Philippians, with so many gods and goddesses to please. They would never be sure if they were in a right standing or not. But we have a heavenly father who loves us. We have an assurance that we are right with God because of Jesus. And the proof of his love is in the cross. And so in our anxiety and our worry, we can bring it to the Lord in prayer and it will be resolved and replaced by his peace. I guess the ultimate question that Paul is asking the believers and us is, do we trust God? No, do we really trust God? That no matter what happens, we'll continue to trust him, that he is good and that he is working for our good. Paul say, yes, he is. He says, yes, God is trustworthy. Bring all your worries to the Lord in prayer and be specific in your requests, he says. And if it matters to you, know that it matters to God and be thankful. Have that attitude of thankfulness that the Lord is in control. And you know what? That assurance that we have can bring incredible freedom to our lives there is a real freedom in total surrender to God trusting him in all circumstances being able to say Lord I know you love me so whatever happens I know I'm secure the fourth tip is that when we do this the peace of God that Paul says transcends understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is a wonderful promise, a wonderful and extraordinary promise that when we do this, when we trust God, his peace floods our hearts. And Paul writes as almost as if God's peace is personified. He uses a military metaphor. God's peace will stand guard over you. It's a wonderful picture. The Philippians lived in a garrison town, they would have been familiar with the sight of soldiers standing guard at the city gates, ready to face down any enemy attacks. Notice that God's peace, his shalom, his wholeness, guards our hearts and minds. I have in mind this picture of a besieged citadel. If it's captured, it will fall, but the good news is it's strongly guarded. Its walls are patrolled day and night. Its defender never sleeps or slumbers. He who watches over us neither slumbers nor sleeps. That's from Psalm 121. God's peace guards our hearts and our minds. Our hearts, our inner being, our emotions, our conscience, our souls, our minds, our thoughts, our desires, hopes, fears. The Lord guards us. His peace guards us. 
Paul too may have even had the sight of a prison guard as he was writing. But because Jesus is near, his peace stands guard over us and we can rejoice as Paul did. Even, even, excuse me, even in persecution, even in suffering, the enemy has nothing on us. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. Paul says that God's peace is supernatural. It transcends understanding. The world does not understand it. It cannot be explained away. And because we have this peace with God, knowing that nothing can separate us from God, not even death, this peace is evangelistic because people will see how we deal with situations because we have this supernatural peace. Remember when Jesus was risen from the dead and he appeared to his disciples, one of the first things he said to them was, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. His peace speaks of the cross and the resurrection. God is not only our God, but our companion. And other people will see this. And finally, Paul says, put this into practice. It's a question of what are we going to do? Discipleship comes from that word discipline. Again, if you've been watching the football, you've seen amazing athletes. Uh, there was one a goal that I watched uh, in the last game last night, a free kick. How does someone get that ability to do that so skillfully? It's because they practice and practice and practice. How do we get wrong thoughts out of our minds? Paul says we focus on those things that are good and true and admirable, godly things, godly characteristics. Think about such things, says Paul, because we remember what goes in often comes out. Yes, it's tough. Life is tough and it's a distracting world that we live in. In so many ways, things that are opposed to God would seek to take our heart and mind away from God, would pull us in this way or that way. But we remember that we are guarded by God's peace. We are citizens of heaven. And so in our discipleship, we begin to practice these new things living it out day by day, practicing avoiding quarrels, practicing staying united, practicing praying, practicing reading the Bible every day, practicing avoiding anything that would distract us or distance us from God, practicing all those things that draw us nearer to God. One of the great things we can do is worship together. We're doing that online, but also live, and in a few weeks, hopefully, we'll all be able to gather once again. And that's really important. And I would hope that we, as a church family, would take that responsibility seriously, that we need to encourage one another to regularly worship together. But there are other ways that we can grow in our faith and practice these things. Find a mentor if you need help doing that. We'd love to help you. Find a small group. Find a place where you can serve and use your gifts and talents. Paul has been saying here in this passage that we are to stand firm in the Lord and he's given us some ways in which we can practice that. To walk with God, knowing that the peace of God is with us. If we're to stand firm as believers and as a church together in the face of opposition, we must practice this discipleship. This is a correspondence course from Paul as he encourages the believers to walk with Jesus. Stand firm in the Lord, he says. Now go and live it out. And may the peace of God be with you always. Amen.